even in the data set. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, we're going to get started uh, pretty soon. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on what's happening. So uh, today uh, we are in week nine. So we have the team that's going to present co-reference resolution. Um, so this will be a nice topic because it bridges back into traditional NLP. We've heard a lot of Neural, 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 and now we'll have NLP for a while. Okay. Um, while we're doing this, uh, of course, we have the projects that uh, you guys are all doing, so I'm going to populate this soon. But uh, just to make clear about this, uh, we have all these projects listings here, and so what we need your help with is to populate it. So, for example, for each of these, we need a title and an abstract, and uh, you were supposed to do it this past week. Uh, but I think most of us haven't done that, so we have uh, a lot of titles here, which I helped you put in. So now I need you guys to go back into the system and uh, put in your abstract. Uh, I think a, a few of you have actually put in something, so that's very nice. Like this, this person here has uh, put in, uh, Yito has put in uh, the rap lyric generator. Okay, and... Um, uh, a nice abstract. So, okay, please go ahead and do that uh, so that uh, we can have some fun and uh, people can uh, get excited about the projects that you're doing. Uh, I think in the next two weeks or so, I'll probably put an announcement on various Facebook pages to tell them to come down and see you guys at the Steps Workshop and, and you can do the same, you can advertise it and, and let people know that your yourselves and, and your fellow course students are, are um, uh, really hitting the edge of the network as it is. Okay, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's go to our presentation. And uh, shall we put this in presentation format? Is that easier? Go for it. Okay. All right. Okay. Just switching sides to left and right, yeah? Yeah. Try your best. If you get that button, never mind. Okay, okay. Well, so hello there. Uh, this week is about core reference resolution, as it can be seen there. Uh, there's going to be a bit of uh, linguistics in the beginning, of what this whole concept is about, then some traditional techniques, and then moving on to more, more recent approaches with neural nets. And, well, let's get started without further ado. So what, what is core reference resolution as the core topic? So basically, if you look at some text, you want to identify which are dimensions of real world entities. This is really uh, important in various, uh, uh, various domains like translation or just question answering. I'll see a few examples for that later. So here's a place, this example text. You can see that these are all of dimensions that happen in there. Uh, some of them are connected, some of them are not. If we concentrate on all of dimensions which are connected to uh, Barack Obama, our named entity, then we see that this is the dimensions that refer to him. And then you can see that the second one is, for example, Hillary in Clinton. These are the references that mention her. But as you see in the beginning, there was also Monday uh, put there as, as another um, possible mention. But that's a, a so-called singleton mention because it's not really referring to anything else. So you kind of need to, need to have a deeper understanding of the text that have some reasoning capabilities in order to find out which, which of these things are connected and which of these things are relevant in the first place. And why, why is this uh, an interesting thing to think about? As I said, you can use it to extract information from a text since you, it's, it's not always going to be, if you have your named entity recognized in one place, it's not going to be repeated all over, uh, all over the text. It's going to be referred by some, some pronoun or something. So you need to look back to it. Here. Sorry about oh, yeah. that. Is it, is it a uh, there's a problem because I have my oh, the, the window is in the wrong place. Let's go figure it out. Oh, okay, okay. okay. And then I need to share the screen. Give me a second here. Okay. Any questions so far? Or it's all clear? <laughs> Doesn't mean too much here. Great. Yes. Yeah, so one, as I mentioned, one possible thing is uh, 
which you can use this for is, uh, is like information extraction or just really any, any questions you want, you want to answer uh, about the text or summarization. Then translation is another interesting thing because, you know, in different languages there are different uh, genders and pronouns relating to it. And depending on the sequence of them, it might actually have a quite a different meaning. So uh, here's a good demonstration with like English to Spanish. Just changing, if you can see, it's maybe just changing where Alicia and Juan is in the sequence. And it's already confusing Google Translate quite a lot. Uh, clearly, Alicia is a, it's a female name. And the second one says that he is, he is smart. So Google hasn't really been able to uh, untie the co-reference properly in this. Uh, in this case, although if we look at it grammatically, I think it should be it should be a line, not a level. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> so it's it's not a real problem. You need to really understand what's what's going on with the the grammar of the given language in order to properly get this. And then, of course, dialogue systems is a good application for it as well. You need to. Um, get the relevant facts from, from the dialogue in order and, and the references in order to properly understand what the user wants. And well, it is, it is not uh, an easy thing to do. Here is a few, uh, few good examples. You see, there is barely any difference between the first two sentences and, uh, and the second pair. But it does have a quite, quite a different meaning. So the first one, it is basically referring to the cup, uh, filling the cup until the cup itself is full. But the second one is referring to filling the cup from the pitcher until the pitcher is completely empty. So just one, one word difference in the two sentences that it completely changes what the reference is pointing to. And the same with the second pair of sentences. This time it's like, you know, see the, tro the trophy was, was too big to fit in the suitcase or the suitcase was too small for the trophy to fit into it. And these kind of, um, these kind of slight differences are called vinaigrette ones. And uh, yeah, this, uh, I think it's an interesting thing that they propose this as an alternative to the Turing test. <laughs> I, I wonder if, um, you know, they say if, if, if we get this fully solved, then we solve the AI. But uh, I wonder uh, if we actually get some solution around it. I think we'll see some interesting methods later on in the lecture with the, um, with the neural approaches. and. I wonder, it's just an interesting, uh, interesting proposition to think about. I think. If you go back a couple of years, about five years ago, at a, a, a top tier NLP conference, we were arguing about this <laughs> in a plenary session. So people were asking, you know, did we solve question answering because we had things like Watson, we can do Jeopardy, right? We can do huge amounts of data lookup, they can add together all the uh, probabilities to come up with. So is that really solving the question, right? So you, a lot of the Turing test types of things are, are about actually knowing information, right? But here, what uh, Terry Winograd he, he, he came up with this idea was like, he has a very famous paper in introducing this. He said, you know, question answering is not how we should be defining what human intelligence is. You know? So we want the same things that are, he quotes, Google proof. All right, so you can Google all you want, but you're still not going to find the answer, and it's a very basic concept that any human being would be able to get. Okay, so that was what he meant by a human being. So I think it's a really compelling concept, and now, you know, a couple of years later, well, maybe five years later, people have deconstructed it. So, you know, Winograd schemas are still pretty easy to tackle. You can do them using neural architecture, pointer networks, and stuff. Other things that you're going to see are the key deconstruction for you. I guess it's interesting to course to how uh, we always have to redefine what uh, what intelligence is or what, what kind of problems we be pointing us in the right direction. I think it's interesting to observe just over the time how people were like, you know, thinking about chess, so that, oh, it's going to be the Holy Grail. <laughs> it wasn't. Yeah? So. The question whether you're actually that good. 
close to solving? Yeah. Okay, I don't think anyone believes that we're close to solving anything. No, we're good at, we're good at approximating things. Sure. Okay, which neural nets, as I'll argue, uh, are very good at approximating functions. Uh, they don't generalize well. But uh, the, the question is whether we can induce networks that can generalize well, that can do what humans do. Because humans generalize all the time. We can do it from incomplete data. We can approximate. Sometimes we're very loud at approximation, even though our lecture has taught us so many concepts that the final exam we forget all of it. Right? And we give it back. You know, our, we have a nice forget date that keeps on forgetting things. <laughs> when you get older, it would be more you know, on the But the whole point is we do good generalization. Right? Before we can really figure out how to repeat that, we're just you know, iterating. So there's a lot of work to do. It's just that people uh, keep on, you, you can think of it as an adversarial arms race, right? You want to define intelligence. So you set the benchmark at a certain level. It's that maybe a Turing test, you can keyboard it enough, and then say, no, that's not hard enough. And you keep on iterating on that. Because it's in multiple areas of AI that once we, once we solve a problem, it's, we often just think, so, oh, it actually wasn't even the, the, the big question we we're thinking about. <laughs> yeah. That, it's a funny, uh, I guess, a funny phenomenon in the field. Because <laughs> we see, but well, so yeah, this is a really difficult problem, nevertheless. And there are two steps of how, how it kind of should be done. First is to actually detect all dimensions, which is kind of um, still pretty trivial. But then to cluster them properly, which one refers to which. Especially here, if you see my, my values is a dimension in itself, but my is a dimension inside it, so there is a nesting. And uh, you know, see, it's, it's not, really, not, always, um, not always even deductible from just the alignment of the different mentions of what, what belongs to what. So there is, see, I belongs to she, but there were two other mentions completely put together between it. It kind of gets tricky. But there are, um, the traditional way was to kind of try to get, um, get dimensions out, which is like you see this, this, the span of text referring to the same entity. And there are different kinds of mentions. So of course, pron pronouns, uh, the actual named entities, and the noun phrases. Uh, and there are different ways to detect these. For pronouns, uh, you can just use part of speech taggers. For named entities, uh, there are the name entity recognition systems we, we looked into earlier. For noun phrases, we can only use constituency parsers, which is already, well, also another system we already looked into. But combining all of these things together is um, it's, it's kind of over-generating in the long run. So you see, these kind of these things are would all be mentions under I mean, if you if you just create for all of these three things to get together. But some of them are arguably not really, not really um, solving the problem. And many, many of these things will be so-called singleton mentioned, which don't really have anything else in the sentence they refer to. They're just a mention in itself. And that's why it's even the definition of, of mention is, is a bit um, fuzzy in this, uh, in this problem. But yeah, so basically, we can train another classifier to try to filter out which are the good mentions and which are the bad mentions in, in this case. Um, but then it's basically another pipeline in the, in the system since we first have to find all the mentions, then try to find, find which are the bad mentions and which are the good mentions. So it introduces another level of um, a problem. But a way we could um, do this is to just put it together into into an end-to-end -end system instead, or or you can do the detection in one uh, one part and the coreference resolution in one part. But of course, the more stages you have in the system, the more error can uh, can creep in. So kind of that's that's also a good question of how can we avoid the pipelining, and I think that's probably how the evolution of the trying to solve this problem went from the traditional methods to the more uh, neural network architecture based approaches. And then also, just looking at it linguistically, there are different types of coreferences. It's not, it's not really just um, one thing. It could be different types of things. And well, the, the, really, the really simple one, as we can see, is like Barack Obama and Obama. It's, it's basically the, at least very, very easy to deduce that it's the same mention. But uh, usually, 
we have um, we have this reference called uh, anaphoras, which are basically you have the word itself, which is dimension, and it usually has an antecedent, which is the actual named entity, which is well usually appear, appearing in front of it in the sentence, and from this you can deduce the uh, kind of linguistic structure how it's connected. But actually, it's not always the case that mm, well, let me. I mean, I'll get back to it later. So basically, it's this is how it would this is how it would. Um, Look like so. Just a simple co-reference. When you see that it's the same entity, it's kind of easy to tie it together. That is, it's just pointed to the same thing. But when it's an anaphora, first you have to tie the the reference to the name of the entity, and you, you can only recognize it, recognize the entity after that. And these are actually two different types of things. It's not not all of not all anaphoras are co-references, and not all co-references are anaphoras. So it's kind of Making it uh, the whole, all of the categories more fuzzy, which is uh, quite well, it's quite common in linguistics, so it doesn't make the problem easier. You see, a, tip, a special type of anaphora, which is not a coreference, um, is a, a bridging anaphora. There's an example of it. The tickets refer to the concert, which is uh, in, in a different sentence, but they're still connected by. That's why it's a bridging anaphora. But that's not a coreference. Uh, just also mention here, yeah, plug our local research units. The folks at I squared R have been working hard on this for a couple of years, and we have actually the state of the art technology in Singapore for the so There have been a couple of researchers specifically looking at bridging and after all, and and after all. Um, and, and really, Singapore is the leading place to do this type of research. Any more questions? Back into this? Yeah. Okay. Well, here there's a, the problem is that an, an anaphora it doesn't know, so it doesn't always work that way that you have the antecedent in front of the anaphora. Sometimes it's uh, it's behind it, or or there are multiple multiple anaphoras connected to an antecedent which is actually behind all of them. And uh, this is called a cataphora. Here is a nice example of it. You see, Lord Henry Wotton is being referred to two times before actually appearing in the text. So that again makes things a bit more complicated. Of course, I think it's probably something that occurs not just inside uh, literary, literary work. Probably you can find examples of it in, in real life as well. But, uh, but of course, like literature adds another layer of complexity on the whole thing. And well, uh, this is for the introduction. So well, thank you thank you very much for listening. Do you have any questions with the linguistics part or with just co-reference in general? Nope. Okay, well, for attention. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I will talk more about the co-reference co model. Um, so starting with like, uh, there's actually, uh, right now there are three kinds. Um, that is well known. So first of all, the mentioned pair model, which is more traditional, and the mentioned ranking also more traditional and the clustering is something that is more uh, like like recent. Okay, so I, I will start to, to go with more of the basics of the mentioned pair and then mentioned ranking model. So what's a mentioned pair method? So so I mean how do we do the co how do we teach the machine to do co reference co referencing? So the first step is first you need to detect on the mention in, in the paragraph. So after you can detect on the mention what you can do is you can just calculate a co-reference score, which basically you calculate between any two pairs of mentions inside, the, inside your paragraph. And if they are above a certain threshold, you just say that, okay, this is a link. So this is the most simplest method. So how do we train such things? So uh, for this co-reference model, you can always generate a data set with label, uh, what are the mentions and how they link together. So the training is, is also simple. It's, it's just a cross entropy of your, so if you see, you have your log P, M, J, and M, I, basically the co-reference score. So basically you just calculate how relevant is your score <coughs> compared to the cross proof, which is your label. And then you do, you sum on the score across your whole transcend set, and then use it as your loss function for training. 
So this can be a, a, a supervised learning uh, classification. So the, the limitation for this approach is that if you generate one wrong link, everything will merge together. And then that will just mess everything up. So one more thing is if you have a really long document, it's really hard or, it, or almost impossible to process it from the beginning to the end. So that is a challenge for this approach. So how, how people overcome this is they will only keep the highest score link and then they use a local reference to build the whole global structure of the referencing. So just also do the score calculation and then yeah, only keep. So basically you can use a softmax function over on your score and then only keep the highest score link. And when you're training, you also summarize, I mean, you, you just need to sum on your score and you would try to maximize the amount of correct uh, co-referencing calculation that you can have. And to maximize this, it just put into a lock and use it as a as a loss function. So yeah. So to so I mean the, the, the method is there. So right now the question is more in how do we calculating this score? So which is Joel so will talk more about this. Uh, are we first clear about why this task needs to be a ranking task and not a classification task? In a classification task, you're just trying to decide something in co-reference or not. But in many cases in co-reference resolution, it depends a lot on the context. Alright? So let's, let's take a, a very simple set of sentences. Uh, Apple, you know, launched a new product today. The company uh, did very well. Okay? There is no debate that Apple is the right But what happens if I introduce another company in the preceding dialogue? Apple introduced another product today, unlike you know the Samsung blah 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 blah. Okay, the company posted a huge thing. Which company are we talking about? Okay? So there are a lot of times when if you just use classification, you use feature analysis, okay, you're trying to say that Apple is always the answer antecedent for something when these conditions hold, right? But that's true unless there's some contextual evidence that puts it out there, right? So that's why a ranking framework is very important. That in the absence of other pieces of information, you want to compete it, right? But if there's a stronger candidate, okay, then I learned that. So I want to learn preferences not answers. Okay, this is a very different idea there. Right? If I learn preferences, if things are absent, still use my preferences to associate the antecedent with the pronoun or the or reference. Okay? But if I learn classification, it's very brittle. Right? I'm gonna say Apple's always the antecedent. But if it happens that Apple was in the in in a, a, a relative clause. Samsung, blah, 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 which Apple also had, the company, blah, blah, blah. Then you're in trouble because your training data has always been Apple as the antecedent of the company, right? And you're incorrectly associated with that. Okay? So there are a couple places in NLP and in IR in general, information retrieval, where this pairwise ranking is really critically important because we're not trying to learn an association of a target to a classification. We're trying to learn preferences. Okay. When is something better than something else? Right? So that's why many times we use a pair or a list to indicate a ranking rather than classification. Okay? You could do this in images too, right? If you didn't know any better, certain pixels uh, might indicate a certain image under some context. Right? We all have those optical illusions of young woman and the old woman, right? That, that image, right? 
you put that image in a certain context, you will see the old woman. And then you put it in another context, you might see the young woman, right? So it's the same thing. So this type of preferential uh, treatment is really something that's very important and introduced in our course here through the idea of co-reference. Okay? So there are, you can think about your particular projects or your problems, whether it really does admit a classification framework or whether it makes more sense to think of it as a preferential uh, learning. Right? To say that I prefer X over Y. And if I expose to many X's and Y's, I can tell which one is best. Right? Just like if you're wearing glasses or contacts, you go to an optometrist, it does, it, well, 10 years ago they used to do that, A better than B. Right? Nowadays you have an automated machine to do that, but it's the same idea. Okay. All right. Right, so I let uh, Jerry talk more about the <coughs> calculation. So. Right, um, so basically, yeah, um, so basically for this section, uh, they actually go through some of um, the methods of calculate PMI and J, uh, of which I think he also underlines uh, some some of the older methods, the non neural network me um, based methods of uh, doing co-reference resolution in the lecture. So um, like over here, we have some of the features that we use. Um, to train, train these classifiers. So first would be uh, each each sentence in the um in this corpus is classified based on um on like the person number gender agreement. So like Jack gave Mary a gift, she was excited. So uh, the, gen the gender agrees and then semantic comp compatibility and then you have um the syntactic constraints. So John bought him a new car, so him can't be John. And um recently mentioned that entities are preferred. So um, and so on and so forth. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, over here is like one of the um, one of the examples taken from a uh, paper written a while back. Uh, in this case, this is one of the training examples where um, in this paper they actually use a decision tree classifier um, to classify um, uh, name entities uh, in, into uh, they do co-reference resolution based on based on a C five decision tree to decide whether um, uh, two two pairs of uh, uh, mentions are are co-referent. Yeah. So here here are some of the features illustrated um, in in, this, in the sentence. So in this case, uh, separately, Clinton officials say that Bank Human Fifty is the chairman and chief financial officer of uh, Bank America Corp. And so he, they list some of the key features like the distance, um, the I pronoun of the first, uh, the J pronoun, and so on and so forth. Right. Yeah, so next will be the neural approach to to uh, training uh, to doing coherent resolution. So in, in this case, uh, this is the diagram uh, which illustrates the mention pair um, encoding. So in this case, it's a simple feed forward neural network. Um, it just takes in the antecedent and leadings uh, of, of the previous uh, occurrences of previous uh, antecedents which might be co uh, co referenced with a current mention, the features and leading and so on and so forth. This is then passed through uh, the people in network which gives you after a couple of set uh, score which gives you PMI MJ. Right, so this is actually just a layer of the architecture which I believe Mohit will go through further uh, later. Right, so uh, for the inputs of the neural embedding of the network, so like um, they use, um, for the embeddings, it, it uses a couple of features. Like first will be uh, the window of the previous five words uh, after before the mention. Um, five words after the mention and the words in the sentence and yeah, so on and so forth. Together with uh, some other features like distance, document genre and speaker information. Right, so next I'll pass on to Inform to elaborate more. Thank you. We gotta go home. We got to you guys have questions? Please ask. Uh, okay. So, okay, hi. Uh, I'm Ding some undergraduate. So, like, I am not particularly really familiar with this topic. So, if you all have any better explanations for anything that I'm about to go through, just let me know. Uh, like, let the class know, right? Okay. Um, so, I'll be talking about uh, end to end uh, co reference resolution. So, uh, this is like this paper here. It's, uh, it's the first, I mean, they claim that it's the first end-to-end -end model for co-reference resolution. 
uh, what end-to-end -end means is that from the start to finish, uh, it's handled in like with one network. So there's no pre-processing, there's no like parsing and all. So yeah, they have their GitHub link there. So why this is interesting is because like previous methods, um, they tend to use some sort of synthetic parser to pass the document first. So they find some like uh, structure, noun, uh, pronoun, something like that. And then the network will work on top of that, uh, that uh, syntax tree that he has generated. So like a few of the really terrible things that might happen if you use such a parser, right? It says that like um, parsing mistakes can cause like cascading errors, like right? the whole thing would be wrong, and uh, it is not really generalizable to any kind of text because they they need to hand engineer some features, like maybe you see like a noun noun, then something that it means oh it must be the antecedent, but it, it's not like correct, like it's not always correct over all types of text and languages, so uh, yeah. So um, this is uh, this is the previous methods. You input the document parser, then you hand engineer some sort of rules, then you get your mention and your co-reference. Uh, that is the classical method. So yeah, for this yeah for this end-to-end -end approach, uh, the front part would handle the mention detection, and the back part would handle the clustering in all one fell swoop. Uh, so no pre-processing required. And yeah, like how they did this is uh, they consider all possible uh, span, span mentioned, span mentioned. Okay, so, uh, so after considering all possible spans, wait, are you, do you all know what a span is? Okay, so like after considering all possible spans and calculating a score, they rank them. And, and yeah, this uh, since uh, they say that a document typically has around n square number of spans, and to consider all possible pairs, you're going to get like an n to the fourth kind of power here. So if you have like a 3,000 word document, it's going to be like intractable. So they mentioned that uh, like aggressive pruning is kind of crucial to their model design. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is how they uh, quantify their stuff. So, okay, so we have this uh, span ranking. So this span ranking is based on uh, the antecedents. So if you look at Y3, so Y3 will contain the antecedents of a uh, fire in. So uh, the epsilon there is like a now thing. Like uh, it's, it's the antecedent to everything that has like no antecedents. Yeah. So if you have a one bear, means a, a is an antecedent of a fire in, and you have a two, that means a fire is an antecedent of a fire in. Okay, so it sounds weird, but yeah. So this is how they quantify that thing. And yeah, this is an example of how the uh how okay how it starts. So. So um, initially, you have like no antecedents, right? So everything's going to be epsilon until some certain moment, like the four-story building refers to the garment factory. So it, the Bangladesh garment factory will be an antecedent to this uh, four-story building. Okay. So next, okay, so uh, they're just using the, the log likelihood that we always see. And okay, for this, right, this, okay, they have to do, okay, this um, splitting into three different factors here uh, SM, I, J, and then A, I, J. SM is a 
a single mention score of the span itself without considering anything else. So I means the span on the left, maybe it's a garment factory. For the J it would be something like left at. So uh, as a IJ is a score that like, considers both. Uh, it's like uh, if it's co-referent, then the last the last parameter will be high. So let's see, for example, if you look at the left at and 37 people. Uh, left at is kind of a terrible mention. I mean, it's not like a noun or something, just left at. Okay, 37 people probably point to something. So the second parameter in the center will be really high. And since uh, these two have nothing much to do with each other, uh, it will be very low for the, the part. So in a sense, like uh, there's some uh, pruning that's going on here, because only your central portion would be really high. And the same goes for the garment factory and left at. And for the case where the garment factory and the 37 people, these two are really likely to be good mentions, because they seem to talk about some now. So SMI and SMJ would be really high, but they have nothing to do with each other. So like one is not talking about the other. So SAIJ will be really low. Okay, so the epsilon means just means that like it has it is like a rubbish thing like uh the first word it will just be zero because it doesn't have an antecedent. Okay, so uh, this is yes. This. Before, uh, there was a P of MMJ. Uh, the is the uh, It's a different thing, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, okay, I'll, I'll explain it further down because it's kind of uh, a hairball. It took me quite a while to read this. Like, rubbish. Okay. So this is uh, the, the okay, not the entire model. A big part of the model in this whole. Uh, you'll kind of get this picture. So your embeddings come below. Okay, I think like oh, next. Okay, so first you feed in your embeddings from the bottom. Uh, basic LSTM bidirectional. So this okay wait this LSTM right is only across ascendance. It doesn't make sense for you to preserve the same LSTM for the next sentence. Like uh, the document like like somewhere the slides say that it's across the old document rubbish. Okay. So. After that, right, you need to take in like the boundary representation. So you shove them together and then you create a span. So in a sense, the poster so this is a span here. You take like those three. It may not necessarily be those, but yeah. And this is your attention mechanism here. So there's a uh, attention mechanism, I think it's a softmax. Yeah, it's it. I think so. So this uh, attention mechanism, this speed forward, this speed forward net, um, what does it do? Um, okay, I, I forgot what this does. Um, but it will, it's supposed to be a weighing mechanism of some sorts. Uh, let me get back to it if I remember some time in the future. So after, wait, wait. Oh yes, yes, yes. Right. So uh, when you look at a, a long reference site, a very large company, what type of thing is it? Well, it's a company, right? At, uh, at most end in English are right headed. So the, the ending noun is probably the one that you want to use. But it doesn't always have to be that way. It's just that English normally is right headed. So using the attention mechanism that 
trying to figure out which, you know, from a distributional point of view, because that's always the way how we use them, right? not, not in a hard sense, right? Which, which aspects of this reference, right, are, are the ones that we need to pay attention to when we're doing this co-reference? Right? So is it important that it's a big company? Is it important that it's a company? Is it important to red car? Or is it important to Yeah, yeah, I now remember. It's a, it's a headedness attention mechanism. And then after uh, going through the function, you get your x hat, and then you concatenate them into one vector. So your this uh, g vector here is your span representation. So this one g here will represent one span. And after that, you bring your g on to the to like to clobber them together and get a score. So as you see here, this uh, S, M, and S, A were the same S, M, and S, A you get from the four. The ones that uh, I plus J and then the co-reference. So how this is done is uh, first you run them through a P4 net to get the uh, uh, S, M, the single mention score for each of the span. Then after that you get the uh, antecedent scores. And then you do. Then after that you do the basic uh, plus plus thing to get like the, the final uh, SIG co-reference score. And after that you do a simple softmax kind of thing. Uh, softmax. But yeah, the the last one is a softmax. And yes, that's it. That's the entire model. Uh, Okay, so what the results were that we just um, better than the previous ones. So, oh my, let's, wait, how do I, oh, uh, sorry. Okay, like um, this seems has problems with like the Vinograd schema problem. Like it doesn't have any uh, inherent knowledge to steward your net. And next, oh. okay. So um, this is for the headedness finder. If you remember the attention mechanism. Uh, by training this, uh, you are able to find the heads as well by running this that part. So this, uh, whatever heads that outputted by this model is in agreement with the head that came from the synthetic parsers. So uh, are you all familiar with headedness? Uh, of the headedness that we talked about before is you know, what is the constituent part or an independent part. Something like that, a very simple mechanism which people have been doing for many years, which is to say, 
you know, you just find the noun phrase and you take the very last one, and that's the head. Okay? That is fine when you only have size one, right? Because there's a stand, it's one word. Of course, it's going to be right 100%. Okay? But when you take longer phrases, like from two up to length 10, you can see that heuristic doesn't work at all. Okay? And what they're trying to show you on this slide, which is taken directly from the UNLP slide, is that you know, the neural architecture, that, that red attention box that you just saw, is doing actually quite a fair number of work. Okay? It's trying to, to fix the, that broken heuristic that says the last noun in English is the head. Okay? So that, that's what this slide is. Oh yeah, and, and yeah, there's some like, uh, some other problems with this model is that it would be heavily reliant on the embeddings. So if the embeddings like, uh, give like these two parameters like attendant and pilots might lie really close in the embeddings, it might actually think that they are related as such, like when they are not, like they're not pointing to the same thing. Yeah, it's a conclusion. Like, uh, it's scalable, and yeah, you can learn both uh, latent mentions and heads. So, somewhat good. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, so now, next, uh, Mohit. I'm going to talk about clustering models, um, which to link from the previous thing that we talked about. Hi, guys. So just to link from the previous topic we talked about, we talked about neural networks. This is going to be mostly neural networks, but we're going to bring in a lot more other techniques um, from learning, because I think like like essentially with neural networks what you're going to notice more and more is that like end to end isn't going to be enough and and at the end of the day you have to combine many different techniques to build a system that works uh, and that's kind of the overall picture I also want to draw uh, because learning is more than just end to end deep learning um, okay so so what essentially we're going to talk about is like hierarchical clustering, which is like um, hierarchical clustering, I'll come back to in a second, but essentially like the reason why we use it is because um, you can have this diverse structure in sentences where like really don't merge, right? But it could be that this is referring to this, is referring to this, and it's just this chain of things that go back to one antecedent that's one. Right? And that's like what we're trying to capture, essentially. Um, is that, and, and the best way we know to model that relationship is like hierarchical clustering or agglomerative clustering, which is essentially um, looks like this where what you're trying to do is you, you're trying to like say, again, I pulled this visualization just out of nowhere just to present you the problem that we're trying to solve. But the problem we're trying to solve is you have a bunch of stuff at the bottom, right? And then you want to figure out which stuff is the same stuff, right? And the way that we're trying to do it is trying to merge two of them and trying to merge four of them and six of them, uh, sorry, eight of them Right? It's kind of this exponential tree that you're building from the bottom up. Uh, and and to, to kind of impress upon you uh, how hard this is, this is very hard. Um, so, so, like, again, if you look at this analogy of building binary trees, right, you know, this is, this is, this can be expressed by Catalan numbers. Um, and there's a 2n factorial there. 
and then this is just a back of the envelope um, order of calculations, but that can be expressed in 2 to the 2 to the n, and that's exponential space. So how hard is exponential space? If you give me something that can solve a polynomial space algorithm, so a polynomial space contains every NP-complete problem. Every NP-complete problem is in polynomial space. And if you give me an oracle that can solve an NP-complete problem in one, like, in a constant amount of time, it will still take me an exponential number of calls to this oracle to solve one exponential space algorithm. Um, this is, like, really hard. Like, when you start getting into exponential space problems, um, the, even theoretical people start getting very scared. <laughs> uh, and, and like, yeah, I've worked on something that was in order 2 to 2 to the n, and like usually the problems in this field are like conjectures that haven't been touched or improved upon in like 30 or 40 years. That's roughly how hard this is, let's just say. Uh, so yeah, I'll just go through decomposition, you know, network architecture. Uh, so loss functions I think are interesting looking at because a lot of the times, um, the best way you have to make neural networks work is you work with features, you work with loss functions, you work with how these networks are connected together. There's a lot more to, to networks than just building one and then pushing the data through. And, and I always want to emphasize that. Uh, okay, so this is the overall architecture and I'm gonna give a rough sketch of how this relates to this, which is what we're trying to do. Um, so first we're going to figure out like mentioned pair encoders. Uh, so there's, there's two, two networks that get trained here. Uh, one is the mentioned pair encoder to mention ranking model. That gets trained first. And the way you're doing that and what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out pairs of uh, mentions and antecedents, right? And then the idea is that if you figured out a good way to pair these things, you've also figured out a good way to encode these things. Because the ranking is, a, is almost a different network than the encoder. Right? So, so we have figured out a way to figure out the best uh, pairs of connections. Right? And then we found a really good way to encode these. So now, when we have a good way to encode these things, um, you can start doing the cluster pair encoder, which depends on the mentioned pair encoder, which is basically saying, okay, so here's one cluster, which is, at the bottom it'll be just a bunch of clusters, which is, there, here's one mention going backwards, and here's another mention. Is it true that they're all connected? And it's just one mention referring to one thing, right? Uh, and then that's what we're trying to do in cluster ranking model. And, and in cluster ranking model, uh, so let's go back to that visualization real quick because it, it'll help you parse this. So the mention pair model and the mention, rank, uh, mention ranking model will build the bottom of the tree, okay? And then what the cluster uh, pair model and the cluster ranking model will do is they'll try to figure out how to build upwards. And, it's, and, and the way we're going to figure out how to build upwards is actually through reinforcement learning, where we'll essentially figure out the two best uh, clusters to merge, and then we'll merge those, and then we just have a tree with one merge, and the rest is still at the base, and then we're going to find the next best, and then we're going to take a greedy first approach to build this. So that's how you should visualize and, and think about this. And if, I, if I'm like losing any of you, uh, uh, please do ask me. Uh, Am I clear about it so far? Again, this is meant to be a discussion group. So yeah, let, let's pause so for like. Throw in your questions. Yeah, please ask me questions. This, is, this would be a great time to like take a couple questions, actually. If I'll probably know what the correct is for. The right cluster of the main 
Right. Uh, um, so how do you score the mer cluster yeah. merges? Yeah. Um, so so that's kind of this thing is like um, the the ground truth you're given is the full connection, right? And then you know, in essence, you you're given the tree as it should look ideally. That's like the yeah. training, right? But then the question is, how do you build? such that you get this tree in the end? Is that kind of the question, or? Yeah, oh, okay, so this is, uh, so it's, it's a that we are, so you, no. Like, unique, uh, uh, well, it's, data, so like, the, okay. the way that I think about it is that the ground truth is you're given this history, this, this clustering. Like, the ground truth, you'll get this tree, right? Okay. But the question is, how do we train something to build this yeah. tree? Right, and the problem is that, um, so again, like I want to draw you like two to two to the n, right? So, so if you can imagine like a supervised learning task of building, you know, hierarchical clusterings, right? And if you look at deep learning, right, you'll you'll need like let's say one thousand or one hundred examples of each case, right? And if the if the number of different separations is already 2 to the 2 to the n, you're going to need 100 times 2 to the 2 to the n yeah. to have a large enough data set to correctly train. And also, you would need the entire energy of the universe for its entire existence, right? So it's not, it's not feasible to, to supervise learn this. Oh, right. Yes. Output. Yes. So you could yeah. merge nodes at different times and put it in the same cluster. Yeah. So what we want is that after we build this tree, we want to cut it at the right area and then, for example, let's just pretend that it's not a correct Yes. Yes. That all the blue things here correspond to a single coherence chain. So Apple, Apple, the company, uh, headquarters, whatever, all those noun phrases within a document form one correction yellow one might be another thing, like job, job, Mr. job, whatever, all in one cluster, and then in the blue team, right, right. And the black chain. Okay, so that's another cluster, right? So how we arrive at that topology doesn't matter as long as you cut it right there. So when you evaluate clustering algorithms, there's well, many ways to do it in the original slide. Uh, yeah, it's still definitely a hard problem, and uh, uh, again, to solve this type of theoretical problem, you have to take a lot of approximations, right? You yeah. need to do greedy search, yeah. because that's going to be the only thing that's admissible, and even doing greedy search is probably very scary uh, um, um, to run. Yeah, yeah. And, and to kind of add how we have any hope at all of building something like this, um, when we have, like, a training a uh, data set that's like, you know, little o of the amount that we need. It might even be like little of little o, right? It's very small compared to how much data we need technically. Is we will use reinforcement learning. We'll, we'll try to say, okay, so here's the, the tree we would like to have, right? And then here's the available merges actions we have at this point. And then what's the best merge so that eventually we'll end up at this tree? Right, because we we can never get like um, this level of data, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so the reward will be given at the end when you figured out the full chain, right? And then it'll just propagate backwards to like Q learning. I, I'm not going to super cover that, but essentially it's like um, if you take an action that gets you closer to the optimal state, then you get a partial reward of the reward given at the optimal state. Um, kind of like leaving like breadcrumbs. Essentially, it's going to be like breadcrumbs that get larger and larger as you get, as you get to the, the final optimal configuration. Yeah. Other 
It's sometimes these problems are theoretically very complicated, but you and I can do this without any problems. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take a lot of data for us to do reference Sometimes we write the complexities as scientists so that we can accept our solving a hard problem, right? Or actually, it's not so, so hard. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so you're saying, well, no, I, it's I, hard. Yeah, it's, it's really very hard. hard. But, uh, yeah, people have been trying to computationalize it for a long time. And, and yeah, so you have different ways of doing it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so where, where should I stop? Okay. Uh, so this is kind of like the high-level architecture that I just presented here. I mean, I've talked so much about this, this is kind of useless to see. I mean, like, essentially you're going to chain a mentioned pair network with mention ranking, and then you're going to push this into a representation, and you're going to get a cluster, and then you're going to have this question that's repeatedly asked over and over is, should I immerse these two clusters? Should I immerse these three clusters? And so eventually you get to the state where you merge no clusters and that's the final um, that's the final co-reference. I don't know exactly what's the right now and that's the final uh, prediction. Uh, the final set of clusters. Sure, yeah. sure. Final set of clusters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so again you see the same type of thing going on here that we have preferential achievement, right? We're, we're not saying that you're learning that X always needs to Y, right? It's done in a a stage fashion where you're taking the most greedy decision and say, do these things link, right? If they link, please link them together. For a new mention, um, it's composite, right? And then let's study whether that links to anything else, right? So uh, a really simple heuristic from linguistics that uh, people had been using at NLP for a long time is like very simple. If you had linked this entity in the past, it's probably a good chance that you're going to link it in the Right? So, for example, you mention Apple and you say the company, oh, I, I both the link, you know, Apple and the company is co-reference. So, maybe that now phrase is topicalized, right? You're actually talking about Apple company, right? So, the chance that you're going to mention it again in the next sentence is pretty high, right? It's not like we just suddenly change and my dog died or something like that. <laughs> you know, it's not likely, right? So, we have this property in human language that our communication must be coherent. We must be cohesive. So there's all these things that we use when we structure things. And you see some of them in the bridging in Africa, right? So you say, uh, the concert was great, the tickets were hard to get, and, you know, it doesn't sound like from a machine point of view that those things are lit related, but we can link it easily because we know the tickets are necessary to get into a concert and we can link these two things together, right? So all of these types of... Uh, uh, Things that we take for granted are world knowledge that hopefully within the embedding structure you can get. And, and to add to that from a theoretical point of view, like you can you can think of like learning as kind of having access to an oracle, which gives you an answer to a very hard problem in constant time, but that oracle only works on an expected distribution. Right? So the expected distribution would be like in the English language or the Chinese language. And the oracle that you train, it's solving a very hard problem in constant time, right? But it's, it's doing it um, only on the expected distribution. And if you ever try on, on an unexpected distribution, it's going to fail horribly. And, and that's like one way I think about like learning, for example. Um, yeah, this is, okay, so, so what, one, what I want to, like, emphasize is that, like, you know, like, when you're just building the mention pair encoder, there's actually a lot of, I mean, I'm going to skip it very quickly, but there's a lot of features that they mention here, essentially. I, you can read the paper and you can look at what it is, but, like, you know, feature engineering is still, um, a large part of learning, like, even with neural networks, right, you know, they gave all these properties like antecedent, like distances, um, the words that are around each other, and, and possibly like synonyms, which is part of speech. There's like a like at least ten different like sentences they have to like feature selection. These are all like hand engineered 
um, to give good results. So feature engineering is still a large part of deep learning. So come back in two years and you just try to do different. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is really a moving target. People have decided, okay, the idea of end to end is really nice, let's try to do it. And then, uh, oh boy, it explodes in complexity. Let's go hand engineer a couple features in this traditional machine learning trend and then stick them into the neural architecture. That's exactly what we're doing, right? So the idea of embedding is sort of halfway there, right? You can neuralize words into the embedding and then you just hope for the best. You can back talk to that, right? So in some cases, we're still not at the point where we, we get all the nice features into an end to end framework. So we still, in many NLP applications, you still hand engineer filters and features. You stick them in at the last layer into a CRF layer or something like that after you do your file SPM and your normal ne networks, and then bang, you get a slightly better result. So that's not to say that the feature engineers instead, but we're, we're first, uh, getting further and further into the mix where you know we can get features almost for free from the neural network, and then we can teach the neural network uh, through better embedding, better pre training to model certain things that we used to have. That's why I'm saying you are looking at a moving target right now, okay? This is not a stationary field, right? Uh, in six months' time, in three months' time, this will be outdated. So what I want you to take away from this course is that, you know, um, really, uh, what, what is the rationale behind what people are doing, right? Okay, so hopefully you get the idea of attention, you get the idea of embedding, and now you're looking at a particular problem that's undergoing transformation as you speak right now, okay? And then in a couple of years time, maybe somebody in this room is studying a PhD or whatever, will have solved this problem to a better uh, data provider. Yeah, or you, well, yeah, pretty much. It's like, maybe the next new architecture won't need feature engineering and it'll work without all this, but then the next one might, you know, so. Uh, okay, so, so to go back to this, right? We have an encoder and then the ranking. So this is the first network that's trained end to end just to have pairs of uh, mention to antecedent. And I just want to present um, the loss function for this. So let me just set up a bit of the math. So training set consists of n mentions. Um, so this is just like, you know, like you'll get a large number of data set and you're just going to chop it up, right? Essentially, you're going to say, like, uh, here's the things that refer to other things, and these are this is part of the training set, and then this calligraphy AMI means the set of candidate uh, antecedents. That's like everything, right? Like for every um, every mention, a candidate antecedent could be everything before that part um, in the sentence, um, and then so. So ideally what we would like to do at the very, very end is that we would have um, A to equal uh, T, right? Which is that, uh, but, but we're going to get from A to T in steps, right? We're trying to go from A to T, which is we're trying to say that if I have a neural network and I give it a mention, right? It gives me the set of true antecedents, right? But we're going to get there by taking the best antecedent from the pairs, and then we're going to create uh, essentially like a linked list or a connection to get to That's what we're going to try. So, uh, is, that, is, that, is that kind of clear? Okay. So, so, um, Okay, so how are we going to do it? So, like I said, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create pairs uh, uh, of mention antecedent pairs. For one mention, what is the best antecedent? Um, and and uh, what I wanted to present is the loss function. And the reason why I wanted to present the loss function is I think that it's, it's very, like, you know, this is one of the things that you get to control. And, and like, when you get a really complicated loss function that they give you here, it, it means that like, there's at least like a few hundred hours of thinking spent into this loss function. And like that is like, you know, like a loss function I think is one of the biggest contributions to like a, a learning or a neural network paper uh, where like, you know, you really have to think of why to plug in every single thing. 
so I'll try to like disentangle um, this loss network, sorry, this loss function. So let me get the easiest thing out of the way. So this is the, the delta AMI. So that's like for candidate mention, uh, sorry, for a candidate antecedent uh, for this mention, uh, we're going to penalize uh, essentially like a false negative, which is, um, you know, you're saying that this has no antecedent, but, you know, my ground truth says it does. Uh, false anaphoric, where you're saying um, this has, uh, this doesn't have. Sorry, let me, let me, like, essentially, like, uh, so, so this, this case is easy. This case is like you're saying that, uh, oh, I picked an antecedent, but it's not the antecedent that it's supposed to have, right? And then this one is, I didn't pick an antecedent. Uh, I picked an antecedent, but this one has no antecedent. So these, these are just like the three class of errors. It's not, it's not that complicated. Um, the, the key part of it in the paper is actually uh, these alphas. Uh, so what they found is that there's like good alphas uh, for English and good alphas for Chinese. And they're not the same. And then these don't equal each other. So they did like hyperparameter search and they found that, okay, different types of errors um, occur with different frequencies and, and they behave slightly differently, right? These, these types of errors are not exactly the same. And the fact that it ended up in their loss function means that this is important and worth thinking about. So, Let's get that out of the way first. So different types of errors make sense. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You said outputs are hyperparameters. Yeah, alpha is going to be between zero and one, and these are going to be different. Okay, but these are hyperparameters. Yes. So I, they did like either they did grid search or they did like well we found that this is roughly correct. Um. So, so that's alpha. Now let's look at uh, maximize. Uh, so, so now we're going to take the maximum penalty for all the candidate entities. So let, let's say like our, our, we have this network, right? And then this network um, gives us a candidate, right? A candidate list, essentially. And then now, for this mention and all the candidates you're going to give me, uh, I'm going to take the worst mistake you made, and I'm going to assume that all the mistakes you made are that bad. That's what this map is going to say. And it's extremely penalizing. Extremely. Um, and the reason why they have this, uh, I think, is because, like, you know, how many pairs do you have? The answer is a lot, right? You take every word, right, and then you take in the in the sentence, and then for every one of those words, you you take the antecedent, which is all like this, that's a lot of the this, the the explosion in in uh, state space is very large, and then you have and then the the number of links is extremely sparse, right? You can think you have something like n squared links, but then out of n squared link you have only order one number of links. So you have to heavily penalize linking because the number of links is so much smaller than the number of possible links. Does that make sense? So that's why they're heavily penalizing. That's all that maximum says. And then this one is saying, you know, SM minus SM T minus one. That's just saying that if you didn't make the optimal link, then we're going to penalize you because we're trying to find the optimal link. So that's disentangling this entire lesson. Is that yeah. good? Happy? Okay. Uh, but, uh, yeah. so the delta, um, the alpha, yeah. So, so
Okay. You try to follow what those letters stand for there. That's N, F, K, and W, L. False negative, false, and 4X, wrong one. So the first one is false mean. Sorry, false name. What's false mean? <laughs> it means that uh, you think it's an aphorism, but it's not. Okay, so in a case of that, in English, it happens a lot. It is an English. It is pre aphorism. Uh, it's a uh, empty. Whatever word, but it just says it's functioning as part of the statement, but not an aspect. It's not like he or she, he or she's always an aspect, right? But it could refer to something, or we can just not be anything. So false new means you think it was something anaphore, but it wasn't, right? Then the next one is false anaphore, right? So that means you, it's correcting something that meets an antecedent, um, but you, uh, what was it? You have a, a noun phrase, but it's actually not something that should be linked to. So, for example, I have the word apple, but it's actually not supposed to be something that's linked to data. Okay? Uh, false anaphor, the FA, is the one that I just said. Okay? I have a mention, uh, but I'm not supposed to connect it to anything. Okay? And the last one, wrong link, is exactly what we are normally thinking about. You connected the company to Apple, but it was supposed to connect to IBM. Okay, so those are the three key cases that we just mentioned. And just like uh, uh, Al Kane said, uh, it's got to be one of those three cases if you get it wrong. Otherwise, you got it right, so you get a real wrong thing. Yep, essentially, yeah. Uh, okay, so then now we're going... Okay, so going back to this, what we, I just described is a mention pair encoder to mention ranking model, that's done. So now I have uh, essentially an end-to-end -end network um, that uh, does the best pairing of links. And now I make this assumption that, you know, because this model is so good at making these pairs of links, the encoding for the mention pairs must be optimal um, for representing uh, pairs, essentially. Th this is like a slight thing that, you know, people who work in deep learning kind of just hand wave, but it is a subtle thing that I want to point out, is that because you change this end to end, this also has an implication that this encoder is a good encoder. Um, so if it's a good encoder, let's use it to do something else, uh, which is what we're going to do now, which is we're going to use it in the cluster encoder. So, um, you know, you can spend, like, so much time with this, but, but I mean, it's, it's not that hard, right? Like, you look at this and it's like, ah, oh, blah, 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 more stuff. All it is is, like, you're saying, okay, here's one link here, here's another one link here. Um, is it true that they're all referring to the same thing, right? If, if so, merge it, right? And then, and then now, then you take it next level. Here's a cluster here. Here's a cluster here. Is it true that they're referring to the same thing? Merge it, right? And keep merging until you're sure that there's no more, more merging to be done. So these are a lot of, there's going to be a lot of hyperparameter search here. There's going to be a lot of engineering here. Um, there's really, like, that's not worth um, covering, uh, like, this is what you'll have to do to write the paper, but in terms of what's happening here, it's actually not that simple once we've set up everything. Um, 
and and like kind of the way this is gonna work is is like again like you know I I this is gonna be completely uh, this is gonna be reinforcement learning to build a neural network that has a policy that is used to merge. Uh, so let me disentangle what I just said. Um, so we need to train a neural network. Let's say I'm this neural network. Uh, and then at the bottom, like, you know, as this neural network, I'll get this um, sequence of clusters. And then of this sequence of clusters, uh, I have two options. One is I'm going to pick two clusters and I'm going to merge them. Or I'm going to say all the merges are done and you should stop. And then when I as a neural network says all the merges are done and we should stop, that's when we found all the, the co-references. Um, and, and this is going to be done through reinforcement learning. So the way I, we're going to train this neural network is through reinforcement learning, which is because the problem is that we only know if, uh, if uh, we've made the correct sequence of actions, right? Because now we're talking about sequence of merges. We only know if we've made the right sequence of merges um, to get the right clustering at the end. Does that, does that make sense? Now, what we need to do is we need to reward um, every possible step that gets us closer to the final clustering, right? Because there's, there's many ways to get to the final clustering, and we need to reward everything like one by one. That's, that's roughly how reinforcement learning works. Um, and then like, here's a, here's a very simple like, you know, I've just essentially described what this entire slide is doing. Um, this is like an algorithm, like, it, but roughly it's going to be like um, uh, uh, roughly what it'll be is that you have a neural network it represents a policy and a policy is given some data what action do I take and the action is merge two clusters or everything is done right and then the way you train this neural network for the to, the way you improve this neural network is you start with uh, all the data at the, all the clusters at the bottom, and then you run it until it says stop. And then what you do is you take uh, the difference between the correct cluster and the cluster it gave you, right? The correct clustering and the clustering it gave you, and then you amortize the penalty for all the wrong choices to each of the steps. That's essentially what it does. If you study it's like a lot of math, but, but essentially you're saying that, you know, I take all the all the wrong mistakes I made and I just uh, allocate it roughly to each of the steps I took. And what that does is it says that all the wrong merges you did, all the wrong steps you took, get penalized, so you won't do it again in the future. So it, it's this whole technique of, um, you know, if I see a clustering and a different clustering, right, I can see how wrong it is, but how do I penalize the process of making that clustering for these actions? It's, it's a very high-level topic. Uh, we should discuss it more. Yeah, we should... This is worth knowing about if you guys haven't seen reinforcement learning before and if you guys want to ask me a question on how this works. Yeah, yeah, we're just trying to learn a policy with a neural network. And it's this whole problem is how we penalize the action. Because the neural network gives you action. It doesn't give you from the clusters, here's the, um, sorry, from the base level pairs, here's the whole cluster. It'll give you actions that you need to be So we're trying to penalize the actions from the final result. Uh, anyone have questions about this is this is worth talking about, I think. And I want to make sure you guys get a sense of this before I move on. So what are some features in the last word? 
right, that, that uh, allows it to, <coughs> to decide uh, what action to do, whether to merge it or... Yes, right, yeah. What are some features of it? Um, could, you, could you say that again? So you see, we're saying, so the input are the clusters. So, and then based on these clusters, then... You suggest an action. Yeah. So, so the features in this would be the current set of clusters. And the current set of clusters can be pairs, right, which is just a link of one, right, or it can be clusters of pairs or clusters of clusters of pairs. So it's a general purpose um, encoding. So it's some cluster state, essentially. Which is how the, the clustering process looks at this time. And we'll keep we'll keep clustering until the the policy says to stop. And then when it says to stop, we'll look at the clusters that it told us, and we'll look at the clusters that we wanted, which is the ground truth, and we'll figure out the difference, and then we'll push it um, through the actions it took to get there. Like you said before, when you're, doing, uh, you're trying to build a coherence thing, your policy, if you will, is governed by the context, right? If you saw, and again, for the people we said earlier, if you saw Apple and the company, and you come in, but if you saw Apple, then IBM, then your decision might be different. So having, uh, learning that policy is a, a matter of the, the difference of value between the coherence and, and other possible. Sometimes it's like easier from a, I mean, like quality, I mean, I understand that, you know, the person learning, you know, the quality and the, 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 the
So, so the, the, the sure, sure. The reason why, um, the, the reason why we train the neural network to do this is because typically when we think that the the branching factor and the uh, total number of states in the game are intractable by traditional It is, it is simply because of an intractability of like pure search, right? And then, and then like the, the best people doing this, they do like you know Monte Carlo tree search plus this uh, this network, right? So this network you can think of it as like an approximation of the true value, right? And then you throw Monte Carlo at it to get precision values. Um, that that's that's also like very state of the art. That's like how Apple. But, but I mean, the, the fundamental problem why we would use this method instead of traditional research and that sort of stuff is just is the, is the size of the That's the only reason. And yeah. you can definitely use uh, decision trees and then, of course, do that over a precursor to what you're doing now. Just when you have enough data, you might want to try it. Uh, uh, This goes back to another area of uh, research that I teach, which is uh, the information of Google. So if you look at Google, Google has this problem of preferential ranking all the time. Every time you do a search, you have to decide what to show you. Right? So it, it does this to be this uh, very well-known learning to rank type of methodology, which is tiny by several key scientists that might be So um, you know, uh, there, there are a couple of uh, points that I've put Uh, I think what we're seeing here is, you know, when you have policy and reinforcement learning, you're seeing these two things come together. Right? You have policy, uh, which is how you need to make decisions and learning to rank, but also a decision making process, which you can do as you know, a series of uh, preferences that generate a list, uh, uh, right? And in the cluster based approach, you don't actually care about the list, you care about the cluster that change that has are a result of that. So it's a little bit different from learning. That's why we be a, a policy based network. Uh, okay. okay. As long as you're kind, you guys are kind of okay. I'm just seeping into your brain slightly. So I'm kind of happy moving on. Uh, so I actually like, you know, I, I thought about this. I actually don't have the graphs here that show how all well this works. This well works. This is the best method up to now. You know, like that's the thing, is like if you have the best method, you can just be like, well, this is the best method, end of validation, this is the best method. But then um, I, I think what's what's worth discussing is like, okay, so how did we get here actually? And and I want to hopefully um, have a discussion, I mean, depends on how much how quickly you guys want to leave. Um, the, the question is like, you know, we've made progress at hierarchical clustering using neural networks, which is essentially we're claiming to solve what looks like an exponential space problem in polynomial time, um, which is kind of this, like, I'll give you a false dichotomy, obviously, because I don't believe either of these things, but, um, you know, either neural networks are the best things ever, or co-reference resolution is easy, and obviously I believe neither of those things. Um, so, so my, my hope is that hopefully now that you've guys seen everything that you have some thoughts on you know how this stuff works and how do you build a state of the art uh, system to solve a hard problem because I, I assure you like something like AlphaGo like when you look at it was actually a very easy problem to solve much easier than this uh, I mean AlphaGo has a state state space of 10 to the 300 and like, you can say that's comfortable within P space. Um, sorry, uh, AlphaGo, uh, you can say, is safely within exponential time. Maybe. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm very 
paying, playing fast and loose here. Huh? Right. Uh, I, I'm playing fast and loose. I'm just trying to say that this problem looks to be harder than AlphaGo. Um, and, and, but then, if you notice, like, a lot of different things from learning were used to solve this. And, and I, I would say that, like, you know, neural networks aren't that magical. Neural networks are, like, this much of math and this much of computing power. Well, it turns out if you put this much of computing power through any amount of math, you get a lot of results, right? So, so the question is, like, this whole deep learning revolution, is it because of the math or is it because of the computing power? And it's, like, easy to fool yourself into thinking. You know, there's more math there than there actually is, but correlation is not causation. And, you know, we should should be careful before we just say neural networks are the best um, because they're not. <laughs> um, yeah. Is that your last one? Yeah, I think so. Oh, there's just references. It's just like. I still need to sign up for, I think, the uh, moderating, or is it? Yeah, the, the questionnaire. Okay, so which, uh, hopefully, like, I don't know, what, what do you think? Uh, let me check. Uh, probably okay. we can assign you to week 10, because we have okay. quite a number of people for the last couple, okay. but not, sure. not so many people for and, the and first couple. What, what, do you, what do I do in, in refereeing? Yeah, so... Uh, just like what uh, Eugene was doing just now, which is compiling a list of uh, questions or archive papers that are related to the topic and as and when we're doing it. So just like, like when you were talking, I'm also doing the moderation. Okay, and then uh, Eugene was also compiling the entire list of the conversation and then putting that oh, as the, uh, okay, the okay, okay. So, so like uh, kind of like a record of uh, yeah. all the discussions. Yeah, where they okay. Correct. It's yeah. like the scribe in okay. the medical school. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Okay, okay. So I'm I'm happy with the next week. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. I'll put you up on that. Hello. Can you can you present with the next week? Oh, okay. <laughs> Week 14, I think we have too many people. Yeah, so we actually need help with, with others. Um, let me see. Week 14.